Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CAMELS training webinar. This is Rob Bruno, Senior Capital Market Specialist, Division of Capital Markets, from the Office of Examination and Insurance. Before we start, there are some technical tips to help make sure that you can see the console and hear the presenters. First, make sure you allow pop-ups from this website. Second, if your display is not clear, set your screen resolution to at least 1024 by 768 to see the presentation. If your volume sounds too low, check to ensure your volume is turned all the way up, both on your computer and the webinar, webinar console. If that doesn't work, you may need to plug in external speakers. Fourth, for any non-NCUA participants, if you are connected to a VPN, consider disconnecting from the VPN to improve the quality of the webinar audio and the slide presentation. For, N for any NCUA staff participating in the webinar today, uh, remaining connected to Global Protect should not interfere with the sound or visual quality of the webinar. Uh, and finally, uh, listed under the resources uh, on, your, on your console, there are two files. Uh, the PowerPoint file uh, is represent, one of the files is the PowerPoint that we'll use today for the webinar. And the other file is the CAMELS rating system letter to credit unions that was issued earlier this week. Before we begin today's training, I would like to introduce the NCUA Board Vice Chairman, the Honorable Kyle Hopman, who would like to welcome you and say a few introductory re remarks. I will turn it over to Vice Chair Hopman. Thanks, Rob, and good afternoon, everybody. Pleased to be here with you all, and I appreciate your interest in today's webinar, which focuses on the necessary updates to adopt the CAMELS rating system, the addition of a sixth component, the S, for sensitivity to market risk, and redefining the L, liquidity risk. Before I begin, I want to thank NCUA's Director of Office of Examination and Insurance, Kelly Legg, and her team for their extensive work planning and coordinating today's webinar, along with the Office of the Chief Information Officer for preparing NCUA for the transition from CAMEL to CAMELS. I'll note that today's CAMELS training will be recorded and available within 24 hours. Since the late 90s, the NCUA Board has considered adding an S and adopting CAMELS. Indeed, the revised interest rate risk supervision and related guidance that NCUA implemented in 2017 was designed with the prospect of adding the S component. By 2021, a couple of foundational elements were in place that facilitated the addition of the S. For example, the merit examination platform, which replaced AIRS in 2021, included the foundation for adding the S component. More broadly, NCUA's Enterprise Solution Modernization Program achievements, which include the well-established Interest Rate Risk Supervision Program, has made the timing of adopting CAMELS both appropriate and opportune. As a result of these and other developments, then NCUA Chairman Rodney Hood saw the timing was finally a right to adopt CAMELS. Adding the S component enhances transparency and allows NCUA and federally insured consumer and corporate credit unions to better distinguish between liquidity risk, the L, and sensitivity to market risk, the S. Additionally, separating liquidity and market sensitivity allows NCUA to better monitor these risks, to better communicate specific concerns to individual credit unions, and to better allocate our resources. What is not changing, however, is the framework to assign the composite CAMELS rating. For credit unions where liquidity and sensitivity market risk remain at similar levels, from an exam under CAMEL, the composite CAMEL's rating would not change due to separating liquidity and sensitivity to market risk. The current interest rate risk regulations are also not changing. For example, credit unions with less than 50 million in assets are not required by regulation to have a separate interest rate risk policy. Credit unions with assets greater than 50 million must comply with the interest rate risk rule. Fortunately, my fellow board members and I updated the derivatives rule earlier this year supplementing the tools that credit unions can utilize to manage interest rate risk. Regardless of asset size, implementing CAMELS will not create a burden or a significant disruption to credit unions, examiners, or the examination process. Separately, I understand credit unions will experience significant changes this year 
because of re revisions to the capital adequacy framework, call report, and CAMELS. As you navigate these changes, I want to assure you there are various ways to access assistance. Initially, you should ask your examiner and supervisory examiner. If you need further assistance, there's your regional office. And additionally, the Office of Examination and Insurance, what we call ENI, can answer your questions. For call report questions, for example, the CU online mailbox will be your best avenue of support. We will do our best to support you and provide timely answers to any questions you may have. Today's speakers are allotted time for questions at the end of their presentations. So please submit your questions anytime during the webinar. I will now turn it back over to Rob. Thank you, Vice Chairman Hopman. We appreciate those remarks and comments. Joining me in presenting today's training is John Nillis, Senior Capital, Capital Market Specialist, Division of Capital Markets. This webinar will cover NCUA's supervisory rating system update from CAMEL to CAMELS. Over the course of the next hour, we will cover the necessary updates to adopt the CAMELS rating system, that is, the addition of a sixth component, S, for sensitivity to market risk, and redefine, redefining the L component or liquidity component. Please submit your questions in the chat box throughout this presentation. As Vice Chairman Hopman mentioned, uh, we have allocated time after the presentation to answer questions you may have. During this webinar, we will provide background on why NCUA adopted CAMELS, give you the history of CAMEL, talk about the final CAMELS rule, the timeline for implementation, including the on or after April 1st, 2022 effective date. Review the definition of the new sensitivity to market risk component and the updated L component. Discuss how to evaluate the sensitivity to market risk and liquidity risk moving forward. And answer any questions about the change to CAMELS. Why did NCUA adopt CAMELS? The separate assessment of the S and L components enhances examiner's communication of interest rate risk and liquidity risk assessments to the credit union. At the agency level, this change improves the NCUA's ability to monitor and analyze each separate area at the individual credit union level and across the credit union system. This will enable better, enable better allocation of resources to focus on credit unions that are outliers or present increased risk to the share insurance fund. Separating the S and L rating components will provide more transparency to credit unions about their interest rate risk and liquidity risk profiles. The growing complexity of the credit unit industry and the increased concentration in long duration assets is another reason to separate the S and L components. In 1997, mortgage related assets only represented 19% of credit unions total assets. As of September 2021, mortgage-related assets represented approximately 45% of credit unions' total assets. Additionally, adopting CAMELS aligns the NCUA with other federal agencies and approximately 24 state supervisory authorities that already use the S component. The history of CAMEL started in 1979 when the FSIEC developed the Uniform Financial Institutions Rating System, or UFERS, to assess risk on a system-wide basis. UFERS was commonly referred to as CAMEL and later CAMELs. NCUA adopted the CAMEL rating system in 1987. Up until then, the NCUA used a framework called the Early Warning System. Since NCUA began using the CAMEL rating system, it periodically modified CAMEL to respond to changes in the financial services industry, as well as supervisory policies and procedures. Since 1987, NCUA updated CAMEL 10 times. Each time the agency informed credit unions of changes to CAMEL through a letter to credit unions. Now, the March 2022 CAMEL's letter to credit unions Will, rep will replace the currently effective CAMEL letter issued 
in December 2007. Next slide, please. We discussed the history of CAMEL and why NCOA is now adopting CAMELs. So let's discuss what the final rule does. First, NCOA is updating the supervisory rating from CAMEL to CAMELs for federally insured natural person and corporate credit unions. The third bullet point lists the specific parts of the NCOA rules and regulations that require technical amendments to change the term CAMEL to CAMELs. However, the adoption of the CAMELs rating system by adding a sensitivity to market risk or S component to CAMEL and modifying the L component to only evaluate liquidity represents the substance of the CAMELs rule and an enhancement to NCOA supervision. This slide displays the timeline for the addition of S to CAMEL. The NCOA board finalized the CAMELS rule in October 2021, and in the fourth quarter of last year, NCOA became operational ready to implement CAMELS. NCOA Chairman Harper issued the CAMELS letter to credit unions in March earlier this week. We are offering CAMEL, a CAMELS webinar to NCOA and SSA examiners three times in the first quarter of this year, as well as this credit union industry webinar. The effective date for the change to CAMELS is April 1st, 2022. This means that every exam started on or after April will use the CAMEL, CAMELS rating system regardless of the examination's effective date. Starting on April, on April 1st, the composite CAMELS rating will encompass six individual components, each with a rating of one to five. There will be no change to the risk evaluation process. Instead of documenting the sensitivity to market risk and liquidity risk ratings in the combined L component, the sensitivity to market risk or interest rate risk will be documented in the separate S component and the liquidity rating in the L component. As a result of transitioning from CAMEL to CAMELs, the definitions for the S and L components were revised and are highly consistent with the FFIEC's CAMELs rating system. The update to CAMELs does not include changes to the composite or other component definitions or rating criteria. The S and the L will stand alone in the examination process. Not only are the SNL definitions consistent with the FFIEC's definitions, they are also similar to the 2007 interest rate risk or ALM and liquidity risk definitions used in the combined liquidity component. Liquidity re reviews will continue to focus on the ability to fund the operations of the credit union through reasonable cost sources and the sensitivity to market risk component will continue to focus on the impact interest rate changes have on earnings and capital. The rating of either the S or the L component will not potentially mask the rating of the other component. There is no change in the rating approach. The transition to CAMELs is simply disaggregating sensitivity to market risk and liquidity risk into two separate components. Slide 11 shows a side-by-side -side comparison of the 2007 combined L component definition and the new S component definition. The intent of this slide is to provide a visual representation of how the 2007 asset liability management evaluation factors have remained relatively unchanged. The green shaded areas under the 2007 asset liability management definition represent content that is incorporated into the new S component definition. This color comparison demonstrates how content from the 2007 def definition is similar to the content included in the new S definition. This information can be found in the updated CAMELS letter, so it's not necessary to focus on trying to read the definitions from the slide. 
However, as you can see from the color coding, the new S component definition uses similar criteria as the old combined L definition. There are no new review requirements associated with the S component. When evaluating the S component, examiners will review the interest rate risk management program, management's ability to measure, monitor, and control interest rate risk, and evaluate the impact of market sensitivity on current and future earnings and capital. The definition of sensitivity to market risk is in the letter to credit unions and reflects the exposure of a credit union's current and prospective earnings level and economic capital position arising from changes in market prices and interest rates. Effective risk management programs include comprehensive interest rate risk policies and practices, appropriate and identifiable risk limits, clearly defined risk mitigation strategies, and a suitable governance framework. Sensitivity to market risk grades are based on, but not limited to, the following evaluation factors. Sensitivity of a credit union's current and future earnings and economic value of capital to adverse changes in market prices and interest rates. Management's ability to identify, measure, monitor, and control exposure to market risk, market risk considering a credit union's size, complexity, and risk profile. And finally, the nature and complexity of the credit union's interest rate risk exposure. Slide 13 shows a side-by-side -side comparison of the 2007 combined L definition and the updated L definition. As previously mentioned, the purpose of this slide is not to focus trying to read the definition, but instead to highlight that the definition for the liquidity component did not significantly change. The yellow shaded areas under the 2007 liquidity and asset liability management definition represents content that is incorporated into the updated L component definition. As you can see from the comparison, nearly all 2007 content is incorporated in the updated L component. Additionally, there is no change in the liquidity rating evaluation process. The definition of the updated L component is in the letter to credit unions. When evaluating the adequacy of a credit union's liquidity profile, examiners will consider the current and prospective sources of liquidity compared to funding needs and the adequacy of liquidity risk management relative to a credit union's size, complexity, and risk profile. The credit union should have access to diversified sources of funding and limited reliance on funding sources that may not be available in times of financial stress or adverse changes in market conditions. A credit union's liquidity risk management practices should ensure the credit union maintains sufficient liquidity to timely meet its financial obligations and member share and loan demands. These practices should reflect the credit union's ability to manage unplanned changes in funding sources, changes in market conditions affecting its ability to quickly liquidate assets with minimal loss, and to ensure liquidity is maintained at a reasonable cost. We have talked about the definition of the new sensitivity to market risk component, but how will the rating be determined? The guidance examiners will use to evaluate market risk has not changed. The rating assigned to the S component should reflect a combined assessment of both the level of market risk and the ability to manage market risk. Low market risk sensitivity alone may not be sufficient to achieve a favorable S rating. Credit unions with low risk but inadequate market risk management may be subject to unfavorable S ratings. Conversely, institutions with moderate levels of market risk and the demonstrated ability to ensure that market risk is and will remain well controlled may receive a more favorable S component rating. In assessing the level of market risk exposure and the risk management process in place to control it, examiners will rely on the existing interest rate risk regulation in Part 741 of NCUA Rules and Regulations as well as the appendix, as well as appendix A 
to Part 741. Supervisory guidance, including guidance issued on interest rate risk, investments, and asset liability management. The next several slides show how the 2007 combined L component rating criteria is now separated between the updated L component and the new S component. Color coding shows how content from the 2007 ratings are similar to the content included in the CAMELS L and S ratings. The middle shaded section includes the 2007 rating criteria and identifies liquidity rating content with blue fonts and ALM rating content with green font. The blue and green font content is then mapped to the updated L component and new S component, respectively. As you can see, the biggest change is documenting the evaluation of liquidity and sensitivity to market risk ratings separately. We'll now discuss the updated 1 to 5 ratings for both the S and L component. The left column lists the L criteria for one rating and indicates strong liquidity levels and well-developed funds management practices. The credit union has reliable access to sufficient sources of funds on favorable terms to meet present and anticipated liquidity needs. Tom on the right lists the S criteria for a one rating and indicates risk management practices and controls for market risk are strong for the size and sophistication of the credit union and the level of market risk it has accepted. There is minimal potential for market price or interest rate changes to create a material adverse effect on the credit union's earnings performance or capital position. The credit union has more than sufficient earnings and capital to support the level of market risk taken by the credit union. An L rating of a 2 indicates satisfactory liquidity levels and funds management practices. The credit union has access to sufficient sources of funds on acceptable terms to meet the present and anticipated liquidity needs. An S rating of 2 indicates risk management practices and controls for market risk are satisfactory for the size and sophistication of the credit union and the level of market risk it is accepted. There is only moderate potential for market price or interest rate changes to create a material adverse effect on the credit union's earnings, performance, or capital position. The credit union, has, credit union has sufficient earnings and capital to support the level of market risk taken by the credit union. An L rating of three indicates low liquidity levels. Funds management practices and policies are not fully commensurate with its size and complexity or the liquidity risk it has taken. Credit unions rated at three may lack ready access to funds on reasonable terms. An S rating of three indicates risk management practices and controls for market risk are not fully commensurate with the size and sophistication of the credit union or the level of market risk it has accepted. There is high potential for market price or interest rate changes to create a material adverse effect on the credit union's earnings performance or capital position. The level of market risk taken is high in relation to credit union's earnings or capital. An L rating of four indicates inadequate liquidity levels. The fund's management policies and practices are inadequate given its size and complexity or the risk it has taken. The credit union is likely not able to obtain sufficient funds on reasonable terms meet liquidity needs. An S rating of four indicates that risk management practices and controls for market risk are significantly deficient given the size and sophistication of the credit union or the level of market risk it has accepted. There is high potential for market price or interest rate changes to threaten the viability of the credit union. The level of market risk taken is excessive in relation to the credit union's earnings or capital. An L rating of five indicates liquidity levels or funds management practices so deficient that the continued viability of the credit union is threatened. 
Credit unions rated five require extraordinary external financial assistance to meet maturing obligations or other liquidity needs. An S rating of five indicates that the level of market risk taken or exposure to market price or interest rate changes is an imminent threat to the credit union's viability. We completed covering the new S and updated L component definitions and rating criteria. I will now turn the remainder of the presentation over to Senior Capital Market Specialist, John Nillis. Thanks, Rob. The next several slides will address some frequently asked questions in respect to adding sensitivity to market risk to the CAMELS framework. Next slide, please. First question is, does adding the S component place new or burdensome requirements on credit unions or examiners? Well, the update to CAMELS provides additional insight and transparency to the examiner's evaluation. Other than becoming familiar with the new S component and updated L component, credit unions of all sizes do not need to do anything differently to prepare for the transition to CAMELS. Implementing the S component will not create a burden or significant disruption to credit unions, examiners, or the exam process. However, credit unions greater than 50 million in total assets must continue to comply with 741-3B5, which is asking for all federally insured credit unions to adopt a written interest rate risk policy and implement an effective interest rate risk program. Next slide, please. Question is, when assigning a component rating, how much consideration should be given to risk management practices versus the level of risk exposure? Well, the answer to that is the CAMELS rating system assesses the credit union's overall condition based on both quantitative and qualitative elements. Quantitative data, such as the level of classified assets, remains an integral part of that measurement. Qualitative elements, such as the adequacy of the board and senior management oversight, policies, risk management practices, and management information systems are also central to evaluating the credit union's overall financial condition. The relative importance of qualitative considerations for each component depends on the circumstances particular to the credit union. Risk management systems should be appropriate given the nature and the level of risk the credit union assumes. Unacceptable risk levels or an unsatisfactory financial condition, however, will often outweigh those other qualitative factors and may result in an unfavorable component rating. Next slide, please. Will credit unions be expected to have a formal, sophisticated risk management process in order to receive a favorable S rating? Well, Consistent with the NCUA's existing interest rate risk supervisory guidance, the level of sophistication of a credit union's risk management process should be commensurate with the complexity and level of risk exposure, balance sheet composition, off-balance sheet activities, and specific circumstances. Credit unions with more complex holdings, activities, and business structures may require more elaborate and formalized market risk management processes to receive a rating of one or two in the S component. Credit unions with relatively non-complex sheet balance sheet composition and activities and whose senior managers are actively involved in the daily operations may be able to rely on fairly basic and less formal management systems. If the procedures for managing and controlling market risks are adequate, risk exposure is low to moderate, communications are clear and well understood by relevant parties, then basic processes may be sufficient to receive a favorable rating for the S component. Next slide, please. So how is the S rating to be applied when evaluating small credit unions with limited interest rate risk processes? While the NCUA's current exam instructions allow examiners of credit unions with less than 500 million in total assets to use the estimated net economic value tool 
or ENT. The ENT is NCUA's estimate of interest rate risk using standard sensitivity measurements. The ENT provides quantitative interest rate risk category rating, which is a significant factor in determining that S component rating. However, if interest rate risk is significant, other qualitative assessments are available to the examiner to use to provide an S rating. Regarding of a credit union size, the quality of risk management systems must be commensurate with the nature and complexity of risk-taking activities and management's ability to identify, measure, monitor, and control risk. As a reminder, 741.3b5 requires credit unions with assets of more than 50 million to have written interest rate risk policies and implement an effective interest rate risk program. Appendix A to Part 741 provides guidance on how to develop a, prop, uh, a written policy and an effective program. Next slide, please. Agency guidelines require examiners to discuss with senior management and, when appropriate, the board of directors, the evaluation factors used in assigning component ratings and the composite rating. The question is, are examiners limited to only evaluation factors listed in the revised rating system and much and must each evaluation factor be addressed when assessing a component? The answer to that is no, and it's because examiners have the flexibility to consider any other evaluation factor that, in their judgment, relate to the component under review. The evaluation factors listed under a component are not intended to be an all-inclusive, but rather a list of the more common factors considered under that component. Only those factors believed relevant fully support the rating being assessed by the examiner must be addressed in the report and discussions with senior management. Next slide, please. On slide 29, next slide. If the levels of market risk changes between examinations, is it always necessary to change the rating assigned to the S component? Well, the answer is the S component rating should reflect a combined assessment of both the level of market risk and the ability to manage market risk. Accordingly, changes in either quantitative or qualitative aspects of market risk exposure or risk management processes may support a change in the S component rating. While changes in the level of market risk between exams may in some circumstances necessitate a change in the S rating, does not automatically imply a rating change will occur. For example, a credit union that, accept, that accepts additional market risk between exams but maintains appropriate risk management processes along with earnings and capital levels commensurate with the level of risk may not experience an S component rating. Slide 30, please. Will the update to the CAMELS rating system result in a change in a credit union's composite rate? Well, the manner in which examiners assign the composite rating has not changed due to the revisions to the rating system. The composite rating is not a function of an arithmetical formula or rigid weighting of numerical component ratings. Elements of subjectivity and examiner judgment especially in qualitative assessments, remain an essential in assigning ratings. Furthermore, the revised rating system generally should not change the composite rating assigned to a particular credit union simply because of the addition of the S component. Examiners' considerations of the level of interest rate risk when evaluating a credit union's capital, earnings, and liquidity is a, re is a routine and longstanding practice. The quality of the credit union's risk management practices remain a consideration by examiners when assessing a credit union's condition, finding ratings, particularly in the management component. Next slide, please. So the question is, how much weight should be placed on the S component in determining the composite rating? Well, 
The weight attributed to any individual component in determining the composite rating should vary depending on the degree of supervisory concern associated with the component. Composite rating does not assume a predetermined weight for each component, and it does not represent an arithmetic average of assigned component ratings. For example, for most credit unions in which market risk is not a significant issue, examiners would place much less weight on the S component than on other components in determining a composite rating. Next slide, please. To what extent should market risk be carved out of the earnings or capital evaluations? Question, should a credit union with high market risk receive an adverse rating in earnings or capital as well as market sensitivity component? Well, the capital component is evaluated based on risk profile of the credit union, including the effect of market risk and whether the level of capital support those risks. The earnings component evaluates the ability of earnings to support operations and maintain adequate capital after considering factors including market risk exposure that could affect the quality, quantity, and trend in earnings. The importance accorded to each factor should thus depend on a credit union's particular situation. Slide 33, with multiple references to some items across several components, such as market risk and management's ability to identify, measure, monitor, and control, are we double counting these and other items when assigning a rating? Well, each component is interrelated with the other components. For example, credit union's level of problem assets is a primary consideration in assigning an asset quality component rating but it is also an item that can affect capital and earnings component ratings. Level of market risk and the quality of risk management practice can also affect several other components. Examiners consider relevant factors in their interrelationships among components when assigning ratings. Market risk is evaluated primarily under the S component and is only one of several evaluations factors used to assess the earnings and capitals. Components. However, in the case in which the credit union exposure to market risk results in an unfavorable rating for earnings or capital, the examiner must consider the impact of the interrelated risk between these components. Next slide, yes. As we prepare for the introduction to CAMELS, here are a few things uh, that we should remember. Separation of S and L is largely an administrative change and will not impact the results of interest rate risk and liquidity risk reviews. The S component documents the credit union's market sensitivity level and how it measures, monitors, and manages market sensitivity. The L component documents a credit union's liquidity risk level and its liquidity risk management program. And there are no new exam steps associated with the changes to CAMELS. Next slide. Well, this ends our presentations. We'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Brown, and we're now going to take some time to answer some of your questions. As a reminder, we will post answers for the questions that we do not get to at a later date, so keep an eye out for that. Let's get started. Our first question is for Rob. When separating out the sensitivity component, did the NCUA take into account credit unions that serve primarily underserved areas and unbanked or underbanked members that may make it more difficult to meet all requirements of the new sensitivity to market risk category of CAMEL? Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Rob. Um, I think an important point from the presentation is that uh, separating out the interest rate risk or the sensitivity to market risk component um, did not create any new requirements uh, for credit, union, credit unions or examiners. Um, and so the new S component did not specifically take into account uh, uh, credit unions that may be 
uh, designate low income or community development credit unions. Um, however, uh, the examiner will continue to ex exercise judgment when assigning the S component uh, moving forward starting on, on April 1st. That concludes my answer. Back to you, Susan. All right, thank you, Rob. I'm going to stick with you for the next question. If required to have a separate IRR policy, could it be combined with AL management policy or must it be a standalone IRR? Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, thanks, Susan. This is Rob again. Um, it could be part of an asset liability management policy. Uh, the spirit and intent of the interest rate risk rule uh, is for credit union to demonstrate that it has a, uh, an effective interest rate risk program. And so as long as what's included, how interest rate risk is addressed in the ALM policy um, demonstrates what is governing the credit union's uh, interest rate risk management, that would be suitable. Back to you, Susan. Great, thank you. Our next question is for John. John, is there a preferred liquidity percentage or reserve ratio? Hi, this is John Ellis. Thanks, Susan. Uh, there isn't a preferred required reserve or percentage ratio. However, credit union examiners typically um, look at the types of quantitative evaluations that the credit union's own policies have, uh, particular to their credit union that they have and that are board approved. And uh, they want to have the credit union be able to justify why a particular policy ratio, liquidity ratio, or number um, is used, and uh, what are the reasons behind it. All right, thank you. Now I'm going to move on to Rick. Rick, if a member of the CLF, does an FCU have to do annual test borrowing of the CLF? Uh, thank you, Susan. This is Rick Mayfield. So um, there would not be test borrowing per se. So we wouldn't expect and we wouldn't even encourage that the credit union takes out a loan just to see whether or not they have access. Um, but what, what, what does happen is we actually, um, I believe annually, we actually ensure that we have the good um, instructions to be able to wire funds to the credit union if they were to take out a loan. So that would be the extent of it, but no, not a test to actually draw down a line. That That is something that we do not expect. That concludes my answer. All right, thank you, Rick. I'm gonna stay with you for the next one as well. How will unrealized losses on AFS investments impact the agency's assessment of the S component? So this is Rick again. Uh, thanks, Susan. So um, unrealized losses probably would increase uh, NEV volatility. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to have a negative effect, uh, depending on how much it is, but it would probably increase NEV volatility if assets are longer than liabilities. Um, one thing to remember, it wouldn't only be with AFS investments, um, other investments that have unrealized losses or even loans would also um, be in the um, NEB uh, model. So it's, this is just this is not a AFS only issue. It's your value of your assets minus your value of liabilities. So it could be HTM. Um, there it could be trading debt securities if you have those. It could be loans too. So um, any kind of valuation below. The, um, what the amortized cost is, all else equal would have a negative effect versus if they were at amortized cost or higher, but not necessarily a negative effect on the S component. Uh, you can't forget that we also look at the qualitative um, um, factors too, you know, the ability, management's ability to identify, measure, monitor, and control risk too. So sensitivity is only one component of it. That concludes my answer. All right, thank you. Next up, John, 
is the requirement for credit unions to have a separate IRR policy only applicable to federal credit unions, or does it apply to federally insured but state chartered credit unions? Hi, Susan. This is John. Thanks. Yes, this this requirement is under 741, so it applies to both federal and state chartered, or any actually any federally insured credit union. That's my answer. Okay, thanks. I'm going to stay with you for the next one as well. Will capital market specialists be doing both the L and the S review? Hi, this is John again. Yes, typically, especially in the larger credit unions, capital market specialists will be uh, on site. However, uh, just a, a non-specialist can also do the S and the L uh, in addition as they have in the past. Uh, it's just typically you have a specialist level at uh, with larger and more complex credit unions. That's my answer. All right, thank you. Our next question is, what are the chances the FHLB will be considered a contingent borrowing capacity like CLF and discount window? John? Hi. Yes, it's always going to be considered a contingent uh, borrowing source, but it's not right now under consideration to be changed uh, in, the, in the rule to be considered a federal source uh, because we believe Federal Home Loan Bank is, uh, is still market-driven. So uh, right now, no change in the role that we know of. That's my answer. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Rob now. Rob, if your exam is in process prior to April 1st of 2022, will examiners be evaluating the new S component? Uh, hi, Susan. This is Rob. Um, if a credit union, credit union exam is in process before April 1st, um, the examiner will not be um, assigning an S rating. The effective date of CAMELS is for exams that start on or after April 1st. So the examiner will still be evaluating uh, sensitivity to market risk or interest rate risk, but will be including that assessment in a combined L component. That concludes my answer. All right, thank you. Got another one for you. In your opinion, would a shock of greater than 400 be warranted based on the joint agency policy statement on interest rate risk? If so, how severe of a shock may be warranted given the current market? Uh, so, <laughs> thanks, Susan. This is Rob. That, that's an interesting question. Um, and, and a couple of things come to mind as, as I listen to it. Um, I think it's important to understand that NCUA's interest rate risk uh, supervision review uh, and the NEV supervisory test uh, is, is for us. It's not necessarily uh, a test used to run a, a retail credit union. Therefore, uh, I'm in looking at this question for larger credit unions, complex balance sheets, um, complex cash flows. Uh, I think in this environment, uh, a shock of uh, a 400 basis point shock would be suitable. I also think um, uh, um, potentially even higher shocks may be suitable. I think it's appropriate to also test the sensitivity of assumptions that are used by the credit union uh, to generate the model results, uh, at least the, 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 uh, the material assumptions or assumptions associated with material positions on the balance sheet. All that needs to be considered um, so that the credit union has a more global view of what the range of the potential risk outcomes uh, may be. Um, so, in short, uh, I, I think shocking the credit union's balance sheet uh, under a number of different rate scenarios and a number of different assumptions provides benefit. That concludes my answer. Okay, thank you. 
The next question we have is somebody would like to clarify what was said about an ENT tool in reference to small credit unions? Uh, I can take that one, Susan. This is Rob. Um, I, I'm not sure what the, the question is specifically asking. I can say that ENT is uh, an acronym for the estimated NEV tool. It's a tool that NCUA uses uh, to look at uh, interest rate risk, both at an individual credit union level and uh, system-wide. Uh, it is an estimate. It is based on call report information and applies uh, specific assumptions for non-maturity shares. Uh, it also applies uh, specific, specific assumptions for how uh, balance sheet categories will respond to a 300 basis point shock. Um, so it's important to understand it's an estimate. Um, and I also believe that it's important to note that uh, examiners uh, may use the ENT results to be a primary source of information for uh, the interest rate risk rating or post April 1st, uh, the S component rating. The scope of ENT is for credit unions uh, 500 million and less. That is the scope for 2022, and that was the scope of ENT for 2021. So simply put, uh, ENT examiners uh, can use the ENT results for credit to uh, assess interest rate risk. Um, for credit unions, uh, 500 million and less in, in total assets. That concludes my answer. All right, thank you. Our next question is for Rick. Can we use a corporate credit union as an agent for CLF and meet the source definition for federal borrowing outlet? Thanks, Susan. This is Rick Maple. So um, currently, um, we do allow credit unions or corporate credit unions to be agent members for a subset of their members. And there are quite a few uh, natural person credit unions that are um, agent members through their corporate credit union. So this basically means that the, the corporate credit union has purchased ELF membership stock for those credit unions. Now, they won't do it for all of them. Um, most likely won't do it for all of their members, so you need to figure out whether or not they um, put you in that, they purchased uh, agent stock for you. But if they did purchase the agents, um, the CLF stock for you as an agent member, then that would qualify. Uh, another thing about uh, the corporates too, even if you're a regular member, um, you, we use the corporate credit union test correspondence to help with collateral management and, um, you know, doing just and helping with, um, with, with the whole process, too. So there would be interaction with a corporate, even if you aren't a agent member. And that concludes my answer. All right. Thank you, Rick. Next, I'm going to move to Tom. Tom, while the modification of the rating from CAMEL to CAMEL is largely examination related, does the NCUA intend to make changes to the Form 5300 call report to obtain unique analytical metrics to improve assessment of the updated liquidity and new sensitivity criteria? If so, what are the number of changes forecast to be forthcoming? Thank you, Susan. Hi, everyone. This is Tom Fay. Uh, we we um, obviously are rolling out a new, a new uh, natural person call report 5300 from March 31. Uh, we did have a public uh, industry webinar yesterday, I believe, um, and we had one previous to that back on February 10th. So there are lots of changes coming through for the call report. Some may be more interesting for IRR or liquidity, uh, but they were never really the main driver for those things because we thought the the call report was fairly sufficient for assessing interest rate risk and liquidity. Um, but however, some of the change, most of the changes, of course, were for more capital 
uh, related as it was for risk-based capital and, and cooler. Um, and we are asking for a bit more information on the liquidity in the liquidity section. Uh, but by and large, I think we have enough information to do a fairly comprehensive review of uh, interest rate risk and liquidity with the new call report coming up. Thanks. Back to you, Susan. All right. Thank you, Tom. Okay, we've got some more questions about ENT. So, Rob, can a retail credit union access ENT? If so, from where? Uh, hi, Susan. Uh, I see a few questions on ENT. So uh, there are a couple ways to uh, access the estimated NEV tool or ENT. Um, there is a, uh, a display of ENT and um, background information on ENT and its uses included in the examiner's guide on the agency website. Um, I believe that would be under manuals and supervisory guidance. I'm uh, going by memory there. Uh, so certainly uh, just searching the website for examiner's guide and then navigating to the interest rate risk chapter of the examiner's guide, uh, there will be um, a section on uh, the agency's approach to interest rate risk. And that chapter will include um, information on uh, ENT. Another way to find that ENT, there is a uh, template available on our website. It does require some manual input. Um, again, that would be under manuals uh, and guidance, and I to believe it would be uh, ALM tools would be the the hyperlink that would bring you to the template. I should say that uh, both the template that is on our website and the interest rate risk chapter that uh, describes uh, the, the estimated MEV tool, uh, that will change in the coming months. Uh, as Tom previously mentioned, there were some significant changes to the call report, and with those changes, um, we are in the process of uh, reprogramming uh, ENT so that it follows the, the new call report uh, format properly. Um, so there will be a transition period uh, sometime uh, in uh, April and May where um, that template uh, won't be uh, applicable anymore. But once um, we reprogram and with the current call report information. We'll place a new template on the website and update the examiner's guide. That concludes my answer. Okay, I think we're at our hour. So, Rob, do you want to close us out? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Um, as the uh, vice chairman mentioned in his opening remarks. Uh, we will uh, look at all the questions and provide answers and post our responses uh, for the public to see uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, we do want to thank you for uh, your active participation and taking time out of your day to understand NCUA's transition from camel to camels. Thanks very much for your time. This concludes the webinar.